to this cardiology webinar called State of the Heart Cardiovascular Imaging for Patient-Centric Care. The session is organized by Canon Medical Systems Europe. I'm Joanne Schwief, and I'm very honored to be here today with two excellent speakers who are leading experts in the field of cardiovascular imaging. As we all know, imaging playing, is playing an important role in the cardiology guidelines, but the field is changing even more rapidly. We see new technology, but also trials like the ischemia trial recently that have a huge impact, not only how we treat patients, but also how we see the individual roles of imaging techniques and how we optimally apply those to the individual patient. In the next hour, therefore, our two speakers today, Professor Pieles and Professor Kofuet, will share with you their experiences. They will show you how they apply the latest science and technology in their daily clinical routines to give you the patients the best possible care. I'd like to remind you, this is an interactive session. So please don't hesitate to send us your comments, your questions. There's a Q&A function in the panel below. So please send them in. And uh, as we will handle questions after each speaker individually, please don't wait until the end. I would like to introduce then the first speaker today, which is Professor Guido Pialis. Professor Pialis is a congenital cardiologist in Bristol. He's also a professor in sports cardiology. And one of his main interests is understanding how the heart behaves under exercise. He's heavily involved in society guidelines, recommendations, but also works with athletes directly, for example, at Man United. And I'm sure we'll see some slides on that as well. The title of his talk is um, Being One Step Ahead, Detecting Subclinical Disease Using Advanced Functional Imaging. And with that, I would like to give the word to Professor Pialis. Um, there's my title and I uh, almost have to apologize. Of course, this is a bit bold, being one step ahead, detecting subclinical disease, but I would like to show you that um, from the areas of sports cardiology and also cardiomyopathies that particularly in these areas, we need to push our, our imaging um, technology, but also understanding to really di diagnose um, people early because that's important because these diseases such as cardiomyopathies are risk factor for sudden cardiac death. So this is my uh, slide of my disclosures. And um, I, I, I would like to see the slide as um, telling you where I come from, where I've gained my experience um, as a sports cardiologist, but also as an NHS cardiologist working with children and adults with congenital heart disease. So I mentioned already sudden cardiac death. Of course, sudden cardiac death is um, particularly in the athletic world, an event that is highly publicized, although quite rare. You can see here a paper from um, André Lagerge, which is not the newest anymore, but it's an interesting paper. And um, it shows that cardiomyopathies, which we will talk about in the next 20 minutes mainly, um, are a substantial um, burden for athletes when it comes to sudden cardiac death. So that's very important, of course, as you go on with the ages. Ischemic heart disease comes in, please pick your age and um, tell yourself what investigations you need before you do your next marathon for charity. Anyway, why it is important also is because uh, last year, um, Anil Malotra and our FAA group, we published this uh, paper uh, two years ago or now in the New England Journal of Medicine, which caused quite a stir because it um, showed our screening um, program results from the 90s onwards. And what you can see here very quickly is these are the young um, players we missed and who've died because of an underlying disease. And, and strikingly, most of them have a structural heart disease that could have been picked up by imaging question. And they haven't, even when we blinded um, and um, looked at these again nowadays, they would not have been come up as having cardiomyopathy as um, possibly um, um, uh, cessation of her, their careers. However, there are many questions why this is, they were only screened once and so on, but it, but it shows us one thing, and I want to say this, and this is a bit bold, I think maybe also because our imaging technologies are not up to scratch, or we need to really further develop them to uh, be, uh, have a higher sensitivity and specificity. What do we want to do in the end? In the end, we want to do this. Here, I show you echocardiograms from a 15 year old, uh, 16 year old, um, healthy individual, very active, maybe playing football twice, three times a week, but not an athletes. Down here, same age, same gender, matched, even ethnicities matched. 
and we see an athlete here, also 15 and a half, 16 year olds. And of course you can um, discern that the left ventricle is much um, more hypertrophied than in this young man. This is however, a healthy individual athlete. And there was something called the Morgan Roth hypothesis. And they say that if you do endurance training, your heart um, develops eccentric hypertrophy. If you do resistance training, um, it develops more concentric hypertrophy. We don't believe this anymore. And uh, particularly this paper and others have really shown us that it's not the case, but yes, athletic remodeling can happen even in 15 to 16 year olds. Gets more interesting and, and, and more important when we look at the same athletes I showed you in the lower panel again. And here we look at a 16 year old athletes athlete with beginning hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. You can see there's even more hypertrophy. It's also concentric, it's not septal, yeah? but this is an athlete who has a beginning cardiomyopathy. What tools can we use to differentiate between those two? And um, particularly, can we do this early? So we prevent sudden cardiac death, but also we help these, these guys to make the right career choice and be realistic about their prospects. So on. this is really dealing with the gray zone, which means that Diagnosing a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, a left ventricular non-compaction cardiomyopathy, or ABC, DCM in these areas here is easy. We all can do this. But most athletes and also young people um, present with these diseases in this gray area. It could be a normal change. It could also be an athlete. LVH, 13 to 16 millimeters could still be in rare cases, in rare cases, normal in an athlete. And could also be cardiomyopathy. Same with hypertrophic dilation of the LV. All these things um, we see in athletes and it's a gray area. So here we talk about the first guideline or at least the first um, um, position statement and recommendation, which is a wonderful paper written by my sports cardiology colleagues. How can imaging help in the assessment of athletes? And this is worth reading. We, we were missing this before having, having a good experience expertise based recommendation, of course, no clinical trials um, yet, um, to see what are the imaging tools we need. And of course, it's quite clear we need multimodality imaging. We cannot only use echocardiograms, we have to use MR scans, and we have to use CT also when it comes to coronary artery anatomy. But I want to point out one thing in these guidelines, and this is really, there's a separate section about um, strain imaging, um, speckle tracking imaging, and or 3D imaging in the assessment of athletes. And this is something I want to talk a little bit more now because I do think that strain has now a role in the early detection of cardiomyopathies and also in the monitoring of, of athletes. And it's great that this has been anchored into these recommendations. So I want to give you an example, which is a disease we really struggle with um, to diagnose early, not only in athletes, um, but also which when presenting in athletes, is, has a high risk of sudden cardiac death. And this is ARVC or ABC, arrhythmogenic ventricular cardiomyopathy. And you know, there are modified task force criteria um, from 2010. And these are used to diagnose the disease. And I will also come back to this, um, what's new in this uh, area. And it's very difficult to diagnose. If we use imaging, particular echocardiography, then we have a very sobering sensitivity, particularly in specificity. You can see this. We use mainly um, diameters, absolute diameters, or even index that tell you if someone has a likelihood of um, ARVC or not. And this is a short axis view, the RVOG diameter, or in the long axis view. But you can see the sensitivity here is very low. Yeah? Even if you, lose fun if you use functional measurements, like fractional area change, very low sensitivity. So does it mean, this is one, and many people believe this, that echocardiographic changes are just very late in ARVC. The arrhythmia comes first, and that's why we don't pick it up. I would dispute this, and I show you some data um, that would also dispute this. I think maybe we are not just good and clever enough. So why does it matter? Again, this is a barn door ABC. You can even see the pacing lead in the right ventricle. You can see the dilatation of the right ventricle. You can see a rocking movement of the lateral wall, but there's not much contractility, and you can see a hypertrabeculation. So the diameters of this heart, however, and you have to take my word for it, are the same diameters of this heart. This is a healthy, um, these both are 17 year olds, healthy 17 year old athletes. And the diameters of the RVOT, of the right ventricle as well, and this young athlete are the same than in this ARVC patient. So this athlete fulfills criteria for ARVC. Of course, we do other tests and imaging is not the only tool and we have excluded this, but it brings us in a very bit of a predicament to say what is going on here. So um, the question is then, the ARVC criteria we use, 
how often are there actually positive and healthy athletes? And from Sanjay Sharma's group um, in London, um, there's a paper by Abbas Saidi who's, who's, who's looked at this. So blue are athletes and, and yellow are patients with ARVC. And you can clearly see just looking at right ventricular fraction area change or even looking at MRI ejection fraction that a lot of athletes, this is likely pathological. A lot of athletes are in these pathological area who don't have ABC. So either you have a lot of false positives or you really miss disease. So this is very important. So what can we do? And looking after a lot of athletes and looking after a lot of ARVC patients, it became clear the, the following. Firstly, and this is a study we did with a sick kids hospital um, in, in Toronto. And we looked at the diameters that are in the guidelines. Yeah. Here, I can remind you the long axis past sternal diameter bigger than 32 millimeters is AVC, less it's not. And this is even 36 millimeters. These are definite teenage AVC patients. But if you look at it, um, we had 150 patients here. None of these patients fulfill the criteria, 32, 36 millimeters. However, they have definite AVC. So you would not pick them up if you just use the diameter criteria. Although they are different, these are definite AVC, these are people who might have it, and these are the controls and people who have one or two suggestions of AVC. What came out, however, is if we looked at glo global longitudinal strain of the right ventricle, we saw big, big differences. Of course, uh, global strain is not in the guidelines yet, but we could clearly differentiate between um, ARVC and controls, and even between very likely ARVC, definite, and maybe ARVC. So this is something where we thought, wow, RB function might be an early sign of ARVC and not only arrhythmias, we just really haven't looked at it a lot. But of course, there are a couple of other studies. And then we did the next step and, step and we did the multivariate analysis <clears throat> um, for predictors of disease. And of course, we could find out as well that global peak systolic strain is an independent predictor of having ARVC, even in teenagers, where it is, as I said before, extremely difficult to pick this up. Interesting enough, and this is maybe something for uh, the more old fashioned clinicians who say, well, all this strain, I can look, I've seen so many echoes, I can look at an RV wall and I can tell you if there's um, um, hypermobility and dyskinesia and aneurysms. And it's true because the other only parameter who came out as predictive for disease was a simple measurement that Mark Friedberg and, and, and I thought might be useful. And this is a dilatation of the apical part of the RV very straight diameter. You know this, we do our RVD diameters in the longitudinal, so RVD1, RVD2, and RVD3. We introduced an RVD4 because we saw this. This seems to be the difference between athletes who rarely, when they're healthy, rarely have dilatation of the apical part, but early ARVC patients have dilatation. So strain, really something very advanced, very high tech still, and then something which you can see with your own eyes. So that's very interesting. And um, of course, we use strain, and here's an example. This is a 70-year-old Afro-Caribbean Academy player without symptoms, but he's got TVF inversion in V1, V4 um, without early repolarization on the ECG. Though this is not normal until proven otherwise. Also, it can happen in Afro-Caribbean athletes. And we investigated him, and we did strain of the RV, and it was all normal. It's minus 31 which is a normal strain. Um, interesting, you will know as well that the recommendations are now for RV strain, just to look at the lateral wall and not include the septum when we follow these um, recommendations here. However, I would say particularly when we want to look at synchrony, dyssynchrony, particularly in congenital heart disease, and I will show you a nice picture in a minute, we would include the septum. Anyway, um, we've shown even in this paper about the ARVC study um, that there's even a cutoff which we um, found out in a statistical analysis, it's minus 20.6 strain. So in this player, it was all normal. However, of course, as I said, echocardiography is not the only mainstay. And of course we need to do an MRI scan. Huh? And fortunately at United, we have an MRI scanning suite, mainly for MSK, but we use it for cardiac as well, which used to be a problem because the MSK guys want a three Tesla scanner, not a 1.5 Tesla scanner, but with a new 3T Galan, um, we can now even do um, a strain. And uh, you can see here, the right ventricular strain in this player was entirely normal, minus 22, and also the left ventricular strain. And this is by, done by feature tracking. It was absolutely normal. Yes, there is no um, guidelines on what is normal, what is not normal, no cutoff values for MR strain. Um, this is a very nice systematic review. And that shows that to, 
some of the biggest studies even don't overlap in their confidence interval. So that is still worrying, but I use strain a lot, particularly to look at wall motion, regional wall motion abnormalities. Never mind the numbers in athletes, they're a bit lower anyway, but you can identify by echo MR the regional wall motion abnormalities. And as I said, with these pictures on the three Tesla scanner, I'm very happy to do a cardiac scan and so are my radiologists who work with me. So interesting enough, coming back to the, to the, to the expert eye, um, these are the new, um, 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 this is a new uh, current opinion paper, not a guideline recommendation um, led by uh, Domenico Corrado, who has obviously spent his life um, 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 researching and treating patients with AVC. And it's very interesting to see that particularly the diameters we used, and I showed you of the RVOT, they have not found themselves to be repeated in these guidelines because it is appreciated that they do not yield correct information. The sensitivity and specificity is not very big, but um, to look at wall motion abnormalities, akinesia, hyperkinesia has been included. So on one way we use um, modern uh, tools like strain. On the other hand, we seem to be still, and I think it's good, I'm not saying it badly, trusting our expert eye. And I will illustrate this um, and give you an example. Um, Look at this patient. This is a young patient of mine who's got a, a placophilin 2 um, mutation, which is a aggressive mutation in AVC. And look at this um, echocardiogram, phenotype negative. Phenotype negative, if you are sensitized now to the dilatation of the apex, I thought this was not quite normal. And we did an MI scan, which you can see here, and this is a subtle change, but you know, some people would call it the accordion sign, but there's clearly, if not an aneurysm, but some um, abnormal motion. And this was two years ago. And in fact, this patient now has presented with arrhythmias and has a diagnosis of ARVC. So this, you might say you can pick it up a strain, but I do think, yes, the, the, the um, um, expert eye is very important here as well. I wanna stress this point. What else can we do to make these early diseases come out? Well, one thing is uh, working with athletes. You want to know what happens to the heart during exercises. And this is a collaboration with um, all the clubs here and with Canon, where we looked at a simultaneous multi-parameter exercise assessment. So we did exercise imaging. I can show you this here. We have a reclining bike. We use strain. We also put a CPAP uh, uh, mask on so we get oxygen consumption, all the metabolic uh, parameters. Also NIRS, so we get metabolic um, um, or peripheral muscle metabolic changes. And we do strain during exercise. We've published this here. We get very good um, intra and inter observer variability. This is fantastic. And um, the tracking technique here, this is uh, using a Canon machine is, is, is very, very good. And you get um, a strain that increases during exercise. And um, we wanted to know, well, can we use it to differentiate between disease and, and healthy people? And what we did first was we said, can we actually use it to differentiate between athletes and non-athletes. And this is a paper that's just come out now in European Journal of Applied Physiology. These are athletes, these are non-athletes. During rest, athletes have lower strain. But during exercise, strain increases in athletes, whereas in non-athletes, it's very interesting, and I won't play these, uh, you can see the pretty pictures here. In non-athletes, particularly in the longitudinal um, direction, strain peters out. And my, my friend and colleague, Bart Beanins from Barcelona tells me this is exactly what happens from a, a mechanistic physiological point of view that this bringing your motion, this circumferential strain increases during higher exercise more because it's more efficient for the cardiac muscle than the longitudinal one. The big question was, well, we can differentiate between athletes and non-athletes. Can we differentiate between health and disease? And this is some interesting data, it's not been published yet by Barbara Seffer and Luke Mertens in Toronto, that shows that if you've got hypertrophic cardiomyopathy um, youngsters who, are, who have normal strain, and this is just septal strain at rest, if you exercise them, you've got a scissoring effect, and you can see in the controls, strain increases, whereas during exercise, and this is measured here by heart rate, not by wattage, like we do it during exercise in Hokum patients, strain does not increase. You've got no exercise response once you've got a poor cardiac reserve. And this is something we are using now clinically and I think we will use more and more. So that brings me to the biggest guidelines that recently come out. And these are the ESC sports cardiology guidelines. And if you have patients, not only athletes, but patients you want to give exercise advice, be it arrhythmia syndromes, be it um, inherited cardiomyopathies or be it congenital heart disease, this is a paper to go to and all the, all the um, um, experts here on this paper. This is a fantastic guidelines um, and they have just come out um, a couple of months ago. 
If you look after athletes with congenital heart disease, there's another recommendation paper, which um, we have uh, put together also with a group of um, sports cardiologists. And this really looks into the recommendations for athletes with congenital heart disease. Um, when can I let an athlete compete? When can I let them train? When can I let them increase training if they have operated mostly or in rare cases, anaerobic, anaerobic congenital heart disease? And there are a lot of athletes, the most famous one is probably Sean White, the Olympic champion in the half pipe and, and, and snowboarding who has trichology follows and went through the couple of operations like all our patients do. But there are many others and there are also the so-called weekend warriors, okay, who want to um, cycle, want to play footy. And often many of them have congenital heart disease. One in, in, a, one in 150 young adults have congenital heart disease in Europe. So. Um, we have moved away, and this is very important. Previously, these, these patients were assessed by the diagnosis. Do they have fallows? Do they have Epstein's? Do they have coarctation? But of course, this is very unsatisfactory because training status and everything is different. So we have really made these uh, recommendations into an individualized and functional approach to sports um, eligibility assessment. And I will not go through all this, but I want to draw your attention to one thing. We have really, really thought very carefully how to introduce assessment during exercise, because that seems to be the most important thing. What happens to the heart during exercise? And of course, CPET is a, is a method to do this. Of course, it's also important to do a stress ECG, but I wanna show you some stress exercise images um, to illustrate this. Here, we've got two patients, uh, from, uh, same age, 17 year old. One is a footballer, county level. The other one is a pro circuit tennis player in the US, got a scholarship. Both have been operated with fallows. Um, they came to me for eligibility assessment for sports. And the footballer said, well, I'm fine, but my stamina over the last six months has gone down. Of course, you will see this is not a normal RV. There's dilatation. The apex, which is not in here, is probably mo not moving that well. But hey, we see this very commonly. Whereas here, I've got the strain images um, and the tennis player, no dilatation normal strain, minus 22, all fine. You can also see this in the left ventricle with the discerning eye that there's certainly septal interaction here because of raised RV pressures. Whereas here, it's nearly a normal ventricle. It's a bit sluggish here on this side and then the inferior part, uh, but it is all good. So during rest, I would have said, well, fine, you are okay. We would not um, recommend any other operation. Well, then I put them on the exercise bike and look at this now what happens here. This is the footballer, this is a tennis player. So of course they're under suboptimal images, but they're real time images. So real world images. This is very nice, a very nice contracting RV. Look at this RV, this RV is just rocking. The lateral wall is not contracting at all. And if you do st strain measurements and exactly you can see it, you can see the lateral wall, the three segments contracting far, far, far later because of the RVO pressure and because of RVOT obstruction than the septum is. Look at this, whereas in our tennis players, same operation, Everything seems to be okay. Also, the strain of the RV during exercise 23 is low, but it's okay. But here it's minus 11.5. It was higher during the rest. So this RV is really packing in, if you uh, excuse my English, German. Um, yeah, it is clearly packing in. This is not working. So we decided here to do a Palmni uh, valve replacement with a melody valve and look at this. This is now the RV before in the footballer and this is the RV afterwards. So look at this, yes, it does help. RV pressure is reduced and this RV might not recover. He did not have much fibrosis so in MR. This is very important, part of the guidelines, but there's a big stark difference from the begin, uh, from before the valve, after the valve. And this was picked up mainly because of exercise imaging. So exercise imaging and the assessment of athletes, cardiomyopathies, particularly congenital heart disease, is, is anchored into the new guidelines and also into the new recommendations I've just shown you. That's all I wanted to show you, just to summarize. Um, yes, we need imaging, but imaging is not our only tool. We need to integrate it, and hopefully AI will help us in the next years to integrate the imaging findings into findings from ECG clinical data. But we need to do the right imaging. Strain, I do think, um, has, a, has, has a big role to play, and it's making its way into position papers and guidelines, which, which many of us are pleased to see. But of course, multimodality imaging delivers the best diagnostic accuracy. And for example, MR imaging during uh, in the diagnosis of ABC is, 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 is more important than echo, I would say. Um, then 2D strain um, is great to in investigate cardiac response during exercise. But the most important take home message is if you see people with cardiomyopathies and 
also athletes and you assess them for eligibility for sports, one assessment is never enough. I think this is probably one of the, the, the learning points we took from our screening. I showed you the New England paper first. We screened all these people. Well, I've not been involved since the 90s, obviously, but they were screened only once in their active life. And maybe this is not enough. Yeah. And then the other thing is uh, quantitative imaging tools, such as strain technologies, are now good enough across vendors. And I prefer here, and I've, uh, um, as you, I've shown you, uh, shown you pictures from different vendors, but particularly for circumferential strain during exercise, the uh, algorithms are now so fast that I can do this strain analysis while I exercise the patient or the athlete on the bike. And this is really very, very helpful. And I think it can ask, mask early dysfunction. That's all I wanted to say. Um, thank you very much for listening. And of course, I'm happy to take questions now for the next five to 10 minutes, or you can also send me an email. My email address is down here. Thanks very much. Peter, thank you very much for this excellent talk. It's been wonderful to see actually how much information the evaluation and the exercise can actually reveal. And um, so you also mentioned it at the, in, during your conclusion. And I thought maybe you can share a little bit more words on that, on the reliability of imaging during exercise, because I saw you actually do this during quite high heart rates, up to 150, even 200. So uh, can you comment on that, even during the exercise, how you maintain the image quality and the reliability? Of course, and that's a very, very important point. And this is, um, it's been discussed previously a lot. And I think this is the reason why exercise imaging has not been used in the last decade. It's not that now people suddenly have this idea. But I think one problem is, of course, if you exercise, your heart rate goes up and then yeah, certainly you can um, have a frame rate issue. So you need high frame rates during exercise to capture enough um, 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 uh, frames to actually get a meaningful data in systole and diastole. Yeah? But nowadays we can image, do strain with frame rates of 80 to 90 beats, uh, 90, uh, 90 frames per second. And this is important, this is good enough. We've got reliability data um, from healthy um, individuals, teenagers and also teenage athletes. And this is actually excellent. So we've got very, very good agreement. With the RV, it's a bit more difficult. We've got moderate agreement only, but interesting enough, if you image uh, patients, for example, uh, primary hypertension patients or phallus patients, this um, 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 image quality is actually much better because we've got dilated um, RVs who seem to be uh, we seem to be able to image better during exercise. So I don't think this is a, an argument against exercise imaging anymore. That's not true. The data is good. The data is reliability. And, and, and this has been published in, in some groups have published this. TDI is another thing you can use. But of course, again, frame rate is a problem. And also, it's angle dependent. But we use also pathway tissue Doppler to image function during exercise. Thank you. Oh, very exciting to hear. Uh... So with that, um, also for the sake of time, I think I would, we close the Q&A session for Professor Pieles, and I would like to move on to the next speaker. So the next speaker will be um, Professor Klaus Kofuad. Professor Klaus Kofuad is a um, cardiologist, clinical cardiologist, but also research professor at the Heart Center in Copenhagen. And one of his main interests has been using the imaging tools in patients with coronary artery disease. He has been a principal investigator of many large imaging trials, ranging from looking at normal values, markers of early disease, to improving um, management and patient outcomes in patients with more advanced disease. And one of his key aspects in, in his work has always been pushing the boundaries of cardiac CT. So I'm sure we'll have some words on that in the next uh, 20 minutes. So the title of his talk will be The Role of CT and coronary syndromes after the ischemia trial. Yes, I will try and see where I feel that CT will be positioned in the future, uh, specifically on patients with coronary syndrome. And of course, we will have to discuss what, were, what is the impact of the most recent ischemia trial. And I'm sure many of you will be familiar with this section of the 2019 guidelines on the chronic coronary syndrome. It was kind of a rewrite of the earlier version where I think you want to focus on what is on the bottom here. That's actually revascularization because that's actually one of the key things that we need to know when we manage patients with chronic coronary syndromes which patients are 
appropriate to refer for revascularizations and which patients may not may just be managed medically. And of course, it's been a long discussion. Is it ischemia testing or is it fun is structural testing or is it both that can make the call which patient would need an invasive cath? And the ischemia trial have been awaited for quite a long time. So it's quite exciting to see um, the results that came out after this, this, uh, these guidelines from, from last year. And of course, most of you will know that in the ischemia tri trial, they included exclusively patients with a positive ischemia test. And the purpose of this trial was to see what was the treatment impact of an invasive strategy compared to a conservative strategy. And the primary endpoint was that of cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, a acute coronary syndrome, heart failure, or obviously staged cardiac arrest. And as it, will, is a, as it is well known, there weren't any difference in the primary endpoint uh, stating that uh, invasive versus con conservative strategy was uh, equally good or bad, whatever you feel like uh, in terms of looking at the primary endpoint. However, if you look into the supplementary data of, of, of the paper published in the Oakland Journal of Medicine, you can appreciate that most of the events were actually myocardial infarction. And there, there is an interesting uh, aspect, which was also, of course, uh, stressed in the conclusion of the paper. So on the left side here, you see the non-procedural myocardial infarction or what you could call the spontaneous infarction. And here, obviously invasive strategy uh, appears to be, be protecting again, non-procedural myocardial infarction. Of course, the problem here was that that was at an expense of having more invasive procedures to, uh, in the invasive arm. And that kind of, um, kind of neutralized the overall effect on the primary endpoint. So, but th these are aspects that are quite important to, to understand moving on to where we think the role of CT might be in the future. Another very important aspect of the schema trial was this chart from, from the, the second publication on, on health status after revascularization. Just to take you through this, the X axis here, that's the Seattle angina questionnaire score and a number of 100 means that you're virtually as asymptomatic. And the Y axis you see here, the probability of being angina free after the, after the treatment. And what it clearly shows here is that if you do have angina, which means less than 100, then there is a the clear effect of having invasive treatment. So overall, that means that if you want to use CT in patients with coronary, coronary syndrome, I think CT should be a gatekeeper for invasive testing, ensuring that there is a high likelihood of symptomatic improvement among patients referred for invasive evaluation and revascularization and further, this high likelihood of overall benefit should outweigh the procedural risk, which means we want to make sure that the patient have symptoms at baseline so that we can ensure relief of chest pain and improve quality of life by invasive strategy. And furthermore, it's worthwhile running the risk so that they may be protected against spontaneous acute myocardial infarction. So I feel that we should use a CT in patient with recurrent chest pain. That means one case of a chest pain or even no chest pain, that would probably not be appropriate. And in these patients, you want to do CT to identify focal significant epicardial coronary artery disease, which is technically and clinically revascularization uh, admissible. I mean, it's not just enough just to see that there's disease. You need to know whether there is a technical approach that can actually improve the flow in the region. And that leads me on to the second point stemming from the conclusion of the ischemia trial that it appears very likely that there must also be ischemia that's uh, in the subtended significant coronary, coronary artery. So that's why I think we should do CT, but of course, CT has to be combined some, somehow with a functional approach. Of course, that leads me on to one of the most exciting developments within cardiac CT in the last couple of years. If you look at the top left part here, 
we all know that cardiac CT is really good for heart structure, looking at the severity of the coronary artery disease, the extent and the plaque type, and possibly some are also familiar with the ability of, of the CT to look at myocardial tissue characteristics. What is somewhat new is of course that we now can do heart function, uh, including contractile function of the left ventricle. You can assess intracardiac blood flow. I will get back to that. And of course, quantitative myocardial blood flow. And all of that has become possible because the, the previous constraints of the radiation dose appears to, it's not you know, gone basically, but, but it's much lower and which allows us now to do a much more comprehensive assessment of the heart, including both heart structure and function. And some of the features I've listed here, you can do low dose full RR interval. You could do dynamic CT angiography, dynamic perfusion CT. And of course, now we have also the opportunity to do on-site CT FFI, which all adds up to a very comprehensive assessment of, of the whole coronary vascular tree. Just to dwell a little on why, how we should interpret, or at least this is my take on what CT angiography should be used for, because just finding disease doesn't mean that you have to revert the patient for invasive cath. You, meet, you need to think about, is, this, is the invasive cath worth the risk? And that means that you have to assess whether the CAD you find, is that prognostic or non-prognostic? Meaning these, you are, you're all familiar with these, these different indices of prognostic versus non-prognostic. And, and even more important is that when you find a lesion, you need to figure out, is this a focal lesion or is it diffuse? Is it a vessel that's actually in a size that may allow stenting? And um, if, is it, if it's uh, with a bifurcation, then it has to be a really important site of, of, of disease to actually decide for um, uh, referral for invasive calf. And, and basically that's the same principle that should be uh, in some extent, of course, looked at if you think that the patient might be um, suitable for a cabbage. Of course, many of you will be familiar with this very important approach that you, once you find a stenosis, you may on the resting CT angiography assess the CT FRR focally. And, and this, in this way, try to make the call whether a specific lesion may or may not uh, benefit from revascularization. And that's kind of also an interesting and important add on that now is available on site which means that, that that could also be added to the overall comprehensive um, assessment of, of, of the coronary tree. And just, this is just an example of how it may look when you, when you do a full RR cycle. It's kind of, I, I'm sure many of you have seen this before. The novelty of this is of course, that this is a very low radiation dose and actually, after our most recent um, um, upgrade of our scanner, we never do post prospective because it's much more helpful actually to go for the whole RR cycle because the expense in radiation is very low. Yeah, let me see. How do I switch here? Sorry. Yes. Yeah, okay. This is another treat of, of rarity that might, you know, intrigue you and see what the potential are of, of the new technology. This was a 56-year-old uh, man with chest pain. And of course, this is just a still picture or still image, but you can appreciate that the left main artery was normal. There's something here. This is the right coronary artery. It looks big, but somehow there's something here. It's not kind of, it doesn't seem to be connected to the aorta. And therefore we did this very advanced new um, approach, which is a dynamic beat by beat CT angiography where the, the scanner acquires uh, before injection of contrast, you can, every beat, you can have an image, which means that you can do a scene of the contrast transept through the heart. And this, this, this inset here, the arrow indicates the main pulmonary artery, and this is in fact the right coronary artery. So if I set the moving in, in place, you can look exactly here where the yellow arrow is. It's a little slow, but it'll come running. First pass contrast and second pass contrast. And here you can see that this is actually a very rare anomaly of the coronaries where the right coronary artery is actually attached to the main pulmonary artery. And what, what you see here, as an, and that was the information that was, could, could be provided here, that it was a 
uh, unidirectional flow, not from the pulmonary artery to the coronary artery, but the, the other way around. So it's a reverse um, flow from the right coronary artery into the pulmonary artery. And that's the similar thing you can see over here in another projection. See, this is, this is where you see it. It's not that this is a very, I mean, this is a very rare patient. I'm just showing this to illustrate what the potential is for this dynamic angiography that now can be done with a CT scanner with a reasonably low radiation dose. I, I, I believe this is around 10 millisieverts, which is not low, but it's reasonable for this kind of information that cannot be provided in, in, other, in any other way. Of course, the more general, of more general interest is that the similar approach can allow you to do dynamic myocardial perfusion imaging, where you over time record the contrast uh, passing through the chambers, and then you can record what is the the, the contrast pacification in the myocardium, and and in this fashion, very simplistically explained. If you have these curves, you can model. It's just sim very similar to what is done in the positron emission tomography. And out of this comes a estimation of the milliliter per minute per gram in the myocardium. And you can generate these polar maps where the regional myocardial blood flow is estimated. And that's actually really a fantastic new approach where you first do a CT angio, defines as there is a lesion, and then follow up by doing a quantitative myocardial blood flow assessment. And I believe we have a, a, a case here. This is a 67 year old male with a persistent chest pain. He had history of hyperlipidemia and five pack years of smoking. And four months prior to the examination, the patient had an inferior stemma that was revascularized, but somewhat late, more than 12 after, uh, after onset. Um, and at, at the same time, it was noted that the invasive angio had an uh, chronic occlusion of the mid LAD. At the time, the patient had few symptoms and he, it was felt that that should be left alone and, and he was dis discharged with, with uh, just the stenting of the right coronary artery. Uh, some months later, he came back and this is the CT anger where you can see the stent here. It looks open. This is the right coronary artery in the middle here and the skin here looks open. Left coronary artery with, so the circumflex with, with some disease, not really these not really diseased uh, significantly. And here, obviously, there is a severe lesion, which of course is corresponding to the CTO that was uh, detected at the angio during the stem eye. And so we, we did the, the uh, cardiac perfusion to assess, as you, of course, many of you know, if there is no ischemia in the distal region of the LAD, it would not be make much sense to, to try and open this. The patient had chest pain, but still, we it, at least our invasive cardiologists, they would like to see that there is some um, ischemia distally here. And so this is the results of a dynamic CNT myocardial perfusion. If, if you start on the bottom here, interestingly, as, I, as you may recall, the seat, the, the, the revascularization of the right coronary artery, that was quite, quite late and, and we do find a small perfusion defect at rest in the right coronary arteries uh, area. Whereas here there's no resting perfusion or slight resting perfusion in the, in the LAD area. When we infuse adenosine that expands substantially and so surely there is ischemia corresponding to the CTO of the LAD. And therefore the patient went to cath and it was reproduced, of course, that the LAD was occluded. And here, nicely, they were able to reopen that. And the patient were doing much, was doing much better after this. So, of course, this is not the, the standard use of this approach. But I'm just showing it to illustrate that we are able to pick up important physiological impact of the CT, um, or, sorry, of, of the coronaries. Uh, which is a reversible ischemia in the distal portion of, of the LAD supply area. Okay, so moving on to acute uh, coronary syndromes, where uh, there's been a fair amount of discussion on whether CT would have any role. And of course, that was left out completely, I guess, in, in these guidelines, um, maybe because it was a time issue, but and then, well, don't say the COVID-19 word, but I have to because this was actually launched by the ESC this summer, which is kind of a 
I guess, emergencies, um, ESC guidance of how patients should be managed during the COVID-19 pandemic. And I think it's very important or interesting to note here that if you are a intermediate to low risk uh, patient uh, with uh, confirmed uh, acute coronary syndrome with non stemi and actually even with uh, increased troponin, you could go for non-invasive testing. And in the asterisk that states that that is uh, CT. And I, will, I was very happy to see this because whether it, had, it was because we were so lucky to have this published uh, also earlier this year, I don't know, but this was the results of the verdict trial where we did uh, paired CT angiography and invasive cath in approximately 1,000 um, acute coronary syndrome patients. And this is the diagnostic accuracy comparing ICA with um, CTA. And as you can see, I, this was presented last year at the ESC conference. And the negative and predict, positive predictive values were quite convincing. Um, and interesting, of course, aspect here is that we mostly use the 320 CT technology, whereas some centers in, in Copenhagen use the 64 slice. And as it turns out, of course, it, it, it can be done, but the, the proportion of non-diagnostic CT scans are, you know, well, higher. So this kind of leads me to say that if you want to do acute CT in non stemi patient, you, you need really good technology to ensure that, that you don't have, have this almost more than 10% where it's non-diagnostic. That, that would be not, not a good approach. Also at the ESC last year, I presented these initial results on the prognostic value of in, yeah, ICA, into invasive coronary angiography and uh, the corresponding CT angiography. And these are of course also data from the, from the verdict cohort and, and risk that there is ESC prognostic or non-prognostic. That means ESC prognostics, that's left main, proximal LAD and multivessel disease. And, and as it turns out, this just doesn't reach the statistical significance. Whether that's something that you should put much emphasis into, I'm not really sure. But what is really compelling is that it was very clear that the CT was able to distinguish the high risk versus the non high risk patients just based on the CT anchor at the time of hospitalization. It, it leads me to say that CT is at least as good as invasive cath to define the prognosis of, an, a, of a seat of a, a non stemi patient. And, and I think that also adds up to the current ESC guidelines during the COVID pandemic that apparently it, it appears to be reasonable to use the T, CT as the first line approach to, to these, these patients. Of course, we still need some randomized work on this, but I think it looks very promising. And lastly, I just, this is some old stuff, but I think it's also intriguing and relevant for the acute uh, coronary syndrome patients. This is uh, my colleague, Dr. Kuhl, that looked at, you can actually also look at tissue characteristics of the myocardium, just doing a, a simple CT angiography. And here you can see calcification. Here you see fat infiltration and, and you can also see the hypo uh, perfused area here. And is this relevant to look at in a non stemi patient? Indeed it is. Here you, he looked at the outcome and if you have no perfusion defects, that, I mean that the, the, the myocardium looks completely normal, the prognosis is quite good. Whereas if you have scar tissue and or perfusion defect, that's you know an ominous sign. So both uh, this sign, I think certainly that should also be looked at if you uh, intend to look at, to do um, upfront first line CT in patients with uh, acute coronary syndrome. And so for including some of the things that I've shared with you today, uh, in patients with both chronic and acute coronary syndrome, cardiac CT will be very important for the optimization of patient management. And of course, that is to ensure high likelihood of symptom relief and possible extended cardiovascular event-free survival. Following the results of the schema trial, management of patients should be with combined CT angiography and CT myocardial perfusion, which most likely offer an unique, an, a unique opportunity to identify patients who will benefit from coronary revascularization. Uh, 
And lastly, I think that CT is, as do have a praise in, in triashing patients with acute coronary syndrome. And that's um, what I had chosen to show you. So thank you much, very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Klaus, for this excellent talk. Very thought provoking. So I would like to start off with a question on, I think what you mentioned er already early on in your talk is quite important that you said that um, just because you see disease doesn't mean you have to go to the cath lab. And then later on, you show that actually, if you look at the information you can derive from the CT scan versus the invasive angiogram, you actually get maybe more information that actually allows you to separate risk substantially better as compared to the invasive angiogram. So in five to 10 years, do you see yourself still doing diagnostic invasive cath or will it all be CT? And, and that's of course is also a provocative question, provocative question, but indeed, I think that one of the important, well, ways of thought is that uh, within the invasive community, I, th I think it has mostly been focused on identifying lesions that may or may not need um, revascularization. And of course that is a very, very important approach, but, uh, the rest of the coronaries may have equally important information in terms of if there is not obstructive disease in other segments that you, you don't find is obstructive. And of course, if you have a more systematic approach from the invasive cardiologist to look at that also when they do with the invasive cath, then that, that might be you know, a way to go, but I'm, I'm, I'm in the, you know, I mean, I have a, a leg in, in both camps, so to speak. I mean, that's a Danish term. <laughs> Meaning that, of course, it would be it, it is very much easier to uh, to assess the entire coronary tree with a CT. It's simple. It's quick. It's very low risk, and I I don't see why we shouldn't expand the CT in a lot of patients where coronary disease is the topic. To what extent we can totally remove the diagnostic cath and only have a cath in the, in the event that you have already confirmed that the patient will need revascularization. I think th there are two factors there. It's a culture thing, but on the other hand, for uh, being, a, being a scientist, we need to prove that that is actually true and that, that you can avoid an invasive cath and still ensure that the patient receives the appropriate treatment. And so we, we, we need some and of course, obviously, I'm, I'm sure many of you will know that the discharge trial is, is hopefully soon upcoming. Uh, and we're also starting some trials here that will be focusing on as, exactly that question. Are we able by CT and perfusion imaging to um, take out um, any patient that will not benefit from diagnostic cath and only send the ones where there's a truly reasonable um, expectation that revascularization, revascularization will occur and, and the patient will benefit from that. So one other question we received is if you could comment on um, reconstruction techniques. So we have like new deep learning reconstruction techniques. Can you share some experience of that? Yes, and, and of course that, that's a great question. Uh, the, the, um, I think there are different schools of thought here. Um, the main thing is if you want to um, uh, quantify something and you change the way you reconstruct using deep, uh, deep learning, um, you shouldn't you know, change that throughout a process of say scientific research or if you have decided that you think that the, the, the numbers that you get will make a, a significant difference in any clinical decision making. What I can tell you is that what we did here immediately after receiving the, the, the new upgrade of, of our scan is that we, we went through a couple of cases, two, three weeks of, of scanning and the images look very nice. The radiation dose is very low. Of course, it can be that you get some different approaches or, or some different impression on what it looks like. But I mean, I, I'm so old in this field. I, I, I started with filter back projection and just going from that to, to, the, the, to, to the more newer ones, there is a learning curve initially to get, you know, when you do the reads, but 
but I just couldn't make myself go back once I saw that you could do so many more extra things with the scanner uh, using this deep learning. And of course, one thing that I thought is that if you can use deep learning reconstruction and in that way do a full RR cycle, you have a better, you know, you are in a better position to try and remove any motion artifacts that might occur. If you just do perspective and, uh, you know, the old approach of, of, of reconstruction, well, you can do the job, of course, but we sometimes do very difficult patients. And as it turns out, the, 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 the hit rate or the, the success of the diagnostic, uh, I mean, we very rarely have a, 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 a test where we can go back and say, wow, we should have done so and so. Almost always we get really nice images using this new approach. So, so, but of course this is really a learning curve. You, you need to figure out yourself and an individual center how you feel that that should be done. Very exciting to hear. So thank you for sharing your experience today. And unfortunately with that, we've already come to the end of this, uh, this webinar. So I'd like to thank the speakers, also the audience for participating. And um, if you have any more questions or would like to know more, please don't hesitate to go to our website of uh, Canon Medical Systems Europe, where you also will find the recording of this webinar. And with that, I would like to close the session. Thank you. Thank you.